Church. Yeah, we spent the last three weeks talking about the Catholic Church, and uh, you know, it was really interesting. Ron called me on Friday afternoon. He and I, went back during the pandemic, you might recall, um, we kept the class going. Uh, I went over to Ron's house and we videotaped on my cell phone and broadcast it. And we had some great times talking about all different things and, and some ideas to teach. And one of my, uh, my passions has been studying world religions. I studied it both in my undergraduate and my seminary. I, I taught some on it. And one of the things that uh, I've always enjoyed about it is the, how it strengthens not only my own faith, but really helps me witness to people when I can understand and have a better appreciation of their faith. And while Catholicism, I don't necessarily take the John MacArthur position that they're not Christians, certainly Ron uh, helped highlight some of the challenges of some of the doctrinal teachings there. And hopefully we came out of that more equipped uh, when you're talking to your Catholic, I would consider them brothers and sisters, but Catholic friends. And so as I prayed a little bit after Ron called me on Friday afternoon about what to talk about today, I thought, well, what about our Jewish friends? Okay, and we wouldn't call them brothers and sisters, but at the same time, uh, we share uh, a lineage and a history that um, there's a closer connection there than sometimes I think we realize. Uh, and, and so I wanted to uh, spend today, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, Zionism, uh, replacement theology, and witnessing to Jewish friends. So uh, you've probably heard some of these terms before. I know Ron has mentioned them sometimes in his teaching, but never with the deeper explanation. So as I the Spirit really told me that this might be a subject that would be of interest to you, sort of a continuation of what we talked about in our in his series on Catholicism. So let's dive into uh, into this teaching. So first, I want to preface this by Judaism is a very complex religion. Okay, and I'm not a Jewish scholar. Um, I have several Messianic Jewish friends. I have um, studied some. Uh, with some rabbis, I, 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 I've got some book theology on this. So um, what I want to share with you is certainly not anything that's comprehensive, but enough so that we can set the table for some Christian um, issues that are really important and that, are, that you should be aware of. So um, let's start with the timeline of the divided kingdom, because it's really important. It sets the tone for us to understand Judaism. So we, under Solomon's reign, we had effectively a united um, uh, kingdom, um, but that on his death, which roughly is in 926 uh, BC, uh, Israel divided into two kingdoms. The northern tribes refused to follow his son Rehoboam, and you know some of the story there of, uh, that happened after Rehoboam and Jeroboam, uh, et cetera, and so there was this split. The northern kingdom eventually was expelled by the Assyrians in 722 BC, and then followed by the southern kingdom, which was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. And at that time uh, resulted in the exile. About 538 BC, the Persians uh, conquered the Babylonians, which paved the way uh, ultimately for the uh, exiled Jews to return to the land. Um, they began to reflourish in the land. Uh, there was always resistance against them, including the Greek resistance in 332 BC, which is after the Old Testament has officially ended from, from its text. And that's when, and you might call it an Israeli state uh, within its own identity started to emerge. Of course, Jesus was crucified in 33 AD, and then you had in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple. Uh, Jews were scattered uh, uh, via the diaspora, and that's when Judaism really began as a religion, as we know it today. So, um, that's a little bit of your timeline history. Now, let's understand as Judaism starts to emerge as a religion, what exactly, how did that happen? 
Well, we start with the Torah, which is the first five books of Moses, the first five books of, of even the Christian Bible, uh, often referred to as the Pentateuch. They, they were um, uh, part of, of, of the Torah coming together was the translational, um, uh, taking the Masoretic text, um, the Codex, and there's a whole discussion we could have on how that came together. But that eventually came together to be their, what you might call the beginning of the Jewish Bible. It, it then continued into uh, what's known as the Tanakh and the Mikra, which is taking the, the Old Testament books that we would have in our Bible, okay, and systematically, thematically arranging that. Um, it's arranged into really three different sections, the former prophets, the lesser prophets, the minor prophets, <laughs> Um, so if you looked at a Jewish Bible, um, you would see it organized different than our Christian Bible. Um, but that became another part of their authoritative text. Then came uh, the Mishnah, which is the oral Torah. And that is Moses' oral tradition that first was transcribed by a rabbi named uh, Hanasi in 200 AD. Uh, there, there, were, there was another... Um, uh, translation of it, or, or uh, uh, composition, I should say, of it, not really a translation. Uh, and, and before you get too stuck on oral law, or oral, oral tradition, which you know was really one of the things that Ron, I think, highlighted well in his discussion of Catholicism, right? The, the, this idea of tradition um, um, effectively um, infected the scriptures, or, or the understanding of the scriptures. You know, know that tradition by itself is not, um, uh, it's not wrong. Uh, you know, in, in John 21, 25, Jesus even talks about uh, there'll be more than my word. But the, this tradition is effectively the, there was the idea that scribes uh, were alongside Moses recording things that were not, in, or were in addition to the, the teachings that we see in the Bible from Moses. So the Mishnah, the oral tradition, is an important part of uh, the Jewish religion. And then finally, the Talmud, which is comprised of the Mishnah and the Gemara, uh, which is a series of comment commentaries by rabbinic scholars. This is, if you want to call it, the heart of Judaism. It's the, the rules, the regulations. Um, it's 6,200 pages of... Uh, rabbis uh, writing commentary on how to live the, the Jewish life. Um, and it becomes uh, what rabbis effectively um, go to study um, for effect their, what amounts to their divinity school is the Talmud to understand this and be able to, to uh, pastor, uh, I use the term not in the Christian sense, their congregation by understanding Talmud. So that is the authority of the Jewish religion, the books and authorities. So what does the religion teach at its core? First off, it's monotheistic. Okay? They believe in one God. They are ethnically one people, which is really important. We're going to come back to this a few times. Um, that we uh, the, the, culture, the cultural identity of the Jewish people is as as much plays into everything that exists today and has over history. And that's really important. Like I said, we'll come back to that theme. They strictly deny the Trinity and the Messiahship of Jesus. And that's actually professed in one of their 13 principles of faith. And if you go to a more orthodox Jewish person, they will recite their 13 uh, principles of faith every day, uh, or at least weekly, uh, depending on where uh, how, how devout they are in their practice. And I'll read the, um, the 13th principle of faith just so you can understand their clear position on Jesus. I believe by complete faith. Every one of the 13 statement, the statements of faith, if you read it, starts with that phrase. I believe by complete faith in the coming of the Messiah. And even though he tarry in, in waiting, in spite of that, I will still wait expectantly for him each day that he will come. 
Okay? So there is the denying of the Messiah, and we're going to talk more about what that means. So Jesus is not the Messiah, and, they, and, and I will tell you that, and I put this down here in your notes, that they don't really believe in the Trinity. They don't believe in the triune God, and that Jesus is the second of the triune God. Now, you might say why, uh, I know this is a question that I've been asked before, why is that? There, there's, there's some history that tells a little bit more about that. During the first revolt of the Jewish people in Rome, so we're at the time of when, when the temple is going to be destroyed, those who followed Jesus um, were considering abandoning the tribe, the, their tribe, okay? And we're gonna talk more about the importance of the tribe. We know of the 12, the 12 tribes, but in the Jewish culture, what that meant was you're leaving our your ethnic family, okay, and and that became um, uh, even more exacerbated during uh, the second revolt, which happened about sixty years later, uh, when during the Ju Judean revolt. So you had this idea that those people who were following Jesus were being ethnically separated from their families, okay? And that separation is part of, you know, that they were, were starting to take this, this more firm stance that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Now, the other interesting part, and this is something that I don't think a lot of people knew, I certainly didn't until I started studying this, that Many people have claimed to be the Messiah beyond Jesus. Um, it started with Judas Maccabeus, who led the revolt against Antioch uh, Epiphanes in 164 BC. Uh, and then uh, Ron touched on this briefly in his last, that would be in the Apocryphal book, books in 1 Maccabees. You can read a little bit more about him. Um, and that uh, Many rab uh, rabbis will tell you that um, there is every generation, there is someone in the line of David who could be the Messiah. And, uh, but God will determine that at its appropriate time. Uh, and I think as late as like maybe the 70s or 80s, uh, the most recent generation uh, was someone who claimed to be um, uh, the Messiah, uh, or was lifted up potentially to be the Messiah, and ultimately they declared that he wasn't. So that's an important part. And the, and the, the uh, next important thing in terms of the core teachings uh, is Tukan Ola. Um, and this is referred uh, in, the, in the Mishnah as the repair of the world. This is really critical to, to Judaism. Um, it's, it differs from Christianity and, and what we believe in why we do our works because of our faith in Jesus. Um, but it doesn't teach original sin or the depravity of the man. So there's no fall or redemption. But instead, Jews are taught that they're obligated to do good works to achieve a more perfect world. Um, and that fulfilling the mitzvah means following the 613 commandments and, and doing so as strictly as they can. And that's why... Um, Judaism is so core to it is this idea of, of rule following and and then being very adherence and we'll talk about the different I won't get into a lot of depth into it, different levels of orthodoxy but whether it's dietary laws or or the Sabbath or so many of what they do in terms of their prayer um, many things candidly that we as Christians should um, aspire to uh, their devotion to prayer their, their commitment to family, their commitment to fellowship with uh, each other. Um, that's a major part of the 613. I couldn't tell you every single thing, but I've, I've read through the 613 and you, you, you probably would feel exhausted. Like, how can I do this? But to them, it's very different. Um, and I've spent time with some, some Jewish friends and they don't see it as exhausting. They see it, um, many ways, uh, the same way we feel um, when we're really spirit-filled and we're living our life for Jesus, you know, it doesn't feel like it's work. It just, it feels like it's joy. And uh, so don't think of it as critically as it sounds, is, is what I'd like to leave you with right there. Um, I think Chad is exhausted. 
<laughs> um, and another part of it is their charitable acts of compassion. Um, certainly, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how they see this in culture, but um, and that's called zatata, um, which is uh, a really important part of who they are. So the, the Jewish people believe, and, and we'll talk about this when we get to Zionism, that they are the chosen people, that God chose them to have a special relationship with him. And we're going to talk about the Abrahamic covenant. And that God will love and protect them if they follow these 613 commandments. Okay? So there is a little conditionality there that's very different from the way that we think. We don't, I, I don't believe Jesus is going to love and protect me because I do anything in my way of works. I know that because I put my faith and trust and profess my faith. So there's so much more to um, the key tenets of the faith. But this wasn't going to be a teaching on Judaism. We could spend days, we could spend weeks on that. Um, there are other things, uh, everything from the, the holic to which is their, their system of, uh, of uh, ethics and, and, and theological rules, which really guides a, a large part of their Sabbath, which as you know, if you have any Jewish friends, is, is a core component of who they are. We've got the, uh, the Midrash, which is more guidance on, um, on some of their uh, religious practices. Um, the concept of tribe, as I mentioned before, um, you see that in the spirit of Jewish community, uh, whether that's Jewish schools, Jewish hospitals, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very identified into their community. Um, and, uh, and then of course, you know, as I mentioned in, the, in my uh, prefatory remarks, the, uh, the complexity of Judaism, uh, some might say you have this even with uh, Christianity in terms of denominations, is you know, there are branches. You know, you've got you know, orthodoxy and uh, uh, reform and conservative and uh, how much they follow, how modern they are in the way that they, um, uh, they adhere to each of these principles is, is just, it's, it's all over the map. Um, their adherence to the holy days, which ones are more important than others. Once again, you're going to get that all over the spectrum. But just understand, hopefully this just gives you a little bit of the background on Judaism, which gets us to um, the important subject that I really want to cover today from a Christian perspective, which is Zionism. So, Zionism, okay, and I'll define it a little bit later, okay, I'm going to wait to do that, is, is this idea, um, it, it, it has a Jewish origin in it, and that goes back to uh, Eretz Israel. Um, so following the diaspora, although the Jewish people lived in communities throughout the world, um, they, were they were persecuted, and that continued until the mid-19th century, especially in parts of Europe, in the Pale of Settlement, which is sort of uh, the area of Russia, uh, or uh, Western, Western uh, Russia, um, and there began a movement to uh, revive their national homeland, uh, which is the, the phrase Etzel, Eretz, Eretz, Israel, the land of Israel. And this is where they would be safe and no one could expel them. And part of what really corresponds to that is the revival of the Hebrew language, if you study this. That's when Hebrew as a language became their identifying way um, as they started to emigrate back to Israel. Um, of course, there was a modern pioneer of this, and that was Theodore Herzl, who was a lawyer, a journalist, and political activist, and he's often considered the father of the modern Zionist movement. Mm -hmm. And he led the call for the Jewish people to emigrate uh, to an area that was once controlled by the Ottoman Empire. He founded the World Zionist Organization, and um, the first wave of Zionists started to uh, uh, emerge in around the the late 19th century. Now, they were all excited. They thought they were coming to Israel and it was going to be the land of milk and honey, right? But it was pretty much a parent wasteland. And so they uh, very creatively um, created uh, an agricultural base, uh, which are kibbutzes. And um, I remember in my first trip to Israel, the uh, the tour guide who we had was from a kibbutz, and 
it was fascinating talking to him uh, about you know the, the different agricultural and if you go to Israel it's a very vibrant agricultural economy and um, that really candidly started with this this movement the Zionist movement because they had to take this land and turn it into something so they not only had a place to live but a place to flourish so the so understand that this this, this idea that the that the Jewish people could come back to their homeland um, was founded in an ethnic um, pull for them to convalesce as a people that were scattered by the diaspora and yet to come back. Okay, so that's the starting point. But there's biblical support for uh, Zionism as well, and we'll start with the Abraham Abrahamic covenant. And that was directed to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. Um, it's repeated throughout the Old Testament, beginning in Genesis, Genesis over 25 times in Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, and Zechariah. And Genesis 13, 14, 5, and 17, 7, 8 will be our starting point if we start to, to dive into God's Word. Uh, towards the bottom of two, top of three. Okay. And the Lord said to Abram, I'm reading now from Genesis 13. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And then later, uh, in Genesis 17, uh, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So you see here, um, it's the declaration of God to Abraham that this land is not only for him, but for all his descendants. So that's our starting point in the covenant. Now the question would be, well, is that covenant still alive today? So in order to understand that, you have to look at some of the language. And the language clearly supports that this is an eternal covenant, okay? The Hebrew word used in the original scripture is olem. Um, and olem appears 439 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. And it denotes the farthest time, a distant time. In fact, Olam is used in Genesis in the creation story, when God talks about creation for the eternity, okay? So uh, understand that this term is not just used for the possession of land, it's used throughout the, the Old Testament. And if we read Jeremiah 31, 35 to 37, he prophesies this and you can see it very clearly. I'll read it. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night? Who disturbs the sea and its waves roar? The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me before me, from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth stretched out beneath, I will also call all the seed of Israel for all they have done, says the Lord. Now, uh, in the Hebrew language, there's uh, a concept called compound intensifier. There's similar in the Greek language. Um, and what that means is the, the, word is the root word is taken and there are either augments or auxiliary words that are used to um, intensify or amplify it. And in this case, um, the Hebrew uh, word is dalem, or it's the augment of the, the letter D in front of all. And that's used to, 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 to almost, um, now we're talking about eternity, right? Now that's like infinity, right? How, how can there be more? Uh, you can't have infinity plus one, right? But it's, it's designed to suggest that this covenant, if, if there's any doubt, this is a covenant forever. And... Um, you see it in the, the, the dolo used in Psalm 92, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, 
Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting in First Chronicles. And then later in Exodus, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heavens, and all this land that I have spoken I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever, or dolem. Okay? So, we've, we've talked about, in terms of Zionism, that this was the ethnic movement for them to convalesce as a people from their diaspora and the persecution. We've seen that there's scriptural support for that. And now let's go to um, another reason or another basis for, for Zionism, and that's the, the two end time gatherings to the promised land. And we'll study that a little bit before we get into um, uh, more of what I would call the Christian definition of Zionism. So know that before the tribulation, that the Jews are called in the Bible to return in unbelief for preparation of the judgment of the tribulation. And we see that in Zephaniah 2, 1, 2. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. So, the Bible calls for there to be a regathering into Israel before the tribulation. And we know now uh, that just inside the last 80 years, that beginning in 1948, with Israel becoming a nation, that this is more formally taking place. And we will, get, we will talk a little bit more about that. But also, there will be an in-gathering after the tribulation. There will be a return in faith and in preparation for the blessing of the thousand-year reign of Christ. And we see that in Matthew 22, 37, 39. And this is Jesus' words. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Christianity declares that the reason the Jews must accept Jesus before he can return to earth is because of their rejection of him at the first coming, as Jesus declared there in Matthew. So, we've got the Jewish people returning to the land, motivated by their ethnic persecution across the world. We know uh, that the Abrahamic covenant calls for this to be their land. And then lastly, we know that the Bible calls them back to this land, both before the tribulation and before Jesus's thousand year reign. So what's been happening to make that happen? Well, there's been a lot of world events and not really that long ago. So going back to um, following World War, about the time of the end of World War I, uh, was the Balfour Doctrine. Um, and that, uh, there was British authority over the area, and the Zionist movement, remember, had started in the late 19th century. Um, and the area came under British rule, and the, the government made a commitment to the establishment of a Jewish uh, homeland in Israel. Now, if that had just happened, and that's all that had happened, we may not have what's happening in the Middle East today. But World War I, uh, after World War I, the continued unsettling events that led up to uh, World War II, uh, the British mandate uh, in 22, so times are still unsettled, World War I is over, but the League of Nations steps in and starts to have some authority over the area from an administrative perspective. The British really weren't following the Balfour Doctrine. And once again, we could spend uh, a whole session on this issue. But understand that um, because the British uh, government wasn't doing what they needed to do to essentially protect the rights that were given in the Balfour Doctrine, there was a time of a bit of turmoil, okay? Mm -hmm. And that existed all the way up until UN Resolution 181 in 1947. 
So now you've got World War II and everything that's happened. And it called for the partition of Palestine into the Arab and Jewish states, which is what exists today. Uh, and the city of Jerusalem to be governed by a special international regime. And that two-state two system is effectively what has occupied, um, uh, has been the rule since that time. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what the impact of that has been on the Jewish people. Uh, there, there was a continued push for uh, emigration of the Jewish people back to Israel. In fact, there was this law of return in 1950, which guaranteed that all Jews that the right to immigrate to Israel and obtain Jewish citizenship. Um, however, there was an amendment in 1970 that it, it, the amendment's actually interesting. It asks a question sort of like on citizenship application you know, um, uh, who is a Jew? And it defines, uh, if you read it, uh, that if anybody who has a set that effectively accepted another religion is not considered a Jew. So that meant Messianic Jews would, are no longer eligible to, um, so you, you can't become a, a Jewish citizen if you believe in Jesus. Um, and, uh, the Jewish people have been in a state of divide over that kind of stuff, uh, really, ever since uh, they got their independence in 1948. So we look at Zionism as this return to Israel. But what does it really mean to us from a Christian perspective? I want to take a, a little bit of time for us to go through that. So I wanted to define Zionism as, I think, uh, now I'm on page five. Okay. Um, and uh, and this is the way I would want us to think about this from a Christian perspective. It's a religious belief that the return of Jews to the Holy Land and the restoration of a physical Israel is in accordance with Bible proph prophecy. It's motivated by a biblically-based religious conviction that the Jewish people are still God's chosen people and are entitled to possess the land of Israel for all time based on a specific interpretation of Scripture, some of which we've already talked about including the Abrahamic covenant. And from that flow a few elements that we want to be clear on. Um, a clear biblical distinction between Israel and the church. The, the, the quote, any, move, uh, any moment pre-tribulation rapture of the church, rapture could happen at any time. Third, the return of the Jews to the land but there has to be a physical reoccupation. Fourth, the rebuilding of the temple. Five, the rise of the Antichrist. Six, a seven year period known as the Great Tribulation. Seven, the national salvation of the Jews. Eight, the return of Christ to Jerusalem, followed by the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. So Zionism subscribes to the fact that the Jewish people have the right to come back. Okay. And that, that Christianity supports that as well. And that the Jewish people are the chosen people. Their right to occupy Israel is a right that's given to them in the Bible. Now, we need to contrast that with what's been called replacement theology, or more technically, suppressionism. And that says that the New Testament church is the new and true Israel. The church is the true Israel and has forever superseded the nation of Israel and the people of God. It disavows any ethnic future for the Jewish people based on Bible interpretation and the spiritual destiny of the Jewish people is either to perish in its uh, hardest anti-Semitic ways or become a part of another religion, Christianity or Islam. So you might say, how did this replacement theology come to be? Does it have any level of support? Why, why did it come to be? Well, let's, let's take a look at that. First, the first source of, anti, of replacement theology is anti-Semitism. And there's really anti-Semitism, rather than just making a blanket statement that that means anti-Jewish or anti, uh, against the Jewish people, um, I think you need to, we need to 
break that down a little bit deeper. So the first is there there are some um, uh, there are some theories that have emerged over time. One is called the Khazar theory that modern Jews are not descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, instead, they descended from a multi-ethnic conglomerate called the Khazars, uh, that were a Turkish people, um, and that they were Gentiles that converted to Judaism. Uh, so it, it effectively uh, dismisses the, the ethnic Israel people that they have any ethnic claims to the property. It's almost like there really aren't. Uh, they, they, they died as a people. They really don't have any rights. There is also uh, an ethnic or theological anti-Semitism. And uh, sadly, some of this is rooted in uh, the time of the Reformation and Martin Luther. Um, you may know Martin Luther wrote a piece on the Jews and their lives that was written in 1543. And in this treatise, he argued that the Jewish synagogues, schools, prayer books should all be burned, that rabbis should be allowed to preach, that homes, money, and property transferred should be confiscated. He did not, just for clarity, uh, if you read that, which I have, he did not call for the killing of the Jewish people, but it was critical for sure. Um, now, it's really important that we not overly condemn Luther and we take a look at how and why that was written. Uh, Luther, Martin Luther. Um, the first off, um, I don't believe that Luther was anti-Semitic. That's my personal uh, opinion. Um, he wrote in 1523 a book called uh, "Jesus Christ Was Born a Jew," and um, very, um, very powerful piece on uh, Jesus and his Jewish heritage. Um, and one of the reasons Luther wrote it is because he recognized a lot of what Paul recognized, that um, preaching to the Jews and witnessing to the Jews was critically important. And he did that. Um, however, sometime right about the time of 1543, you remember, um, this is about the time that he was in Wittenberg, he was in exile, okay? Um, he was um, effectively condemned by a group of uh, Jewish anti-missionaries, if you want to call them that. And, you know, you might call Martin Luther a modern-day Donald Trump. He's the kind of guy, you know, if you punch at him, he's going to punch back at you. Okay? And, um, and, and so the, they called him a false teacher. If you, if you uh, look at some of the stuff that was coming at him, called him, and this is a guy, you know, who, you know, was so invested into uh, which we now call the Reformation. Uh, he punched back with this piece um, uh, on the Jews and their lives. And, but its effects carried through uh, the Reformation into Protestant culture. Um, and as the Jews were scattered and identifying their own ethnic identities, um, even if you think to this country, okay, when they started emigrating, in the early 1900s. Um, you know, they, they form their own communities, they have their own banks, um, you know, they charged higher interest because that was part of their culture, and, you know, that, you know, set people off in bad ways. So, a lot of the, unfortunately, you know, Luther never got the chance to set the record straight on this, and it did pervasively move through Protestantism all the way into today. So we can't rec we can't dismiss it in its entirety, but need to understand that it is a uh, it is a powerful part of why replacement theology even has any legs. Okay. Um, now we, we like almost any theology, including you know the heresies of the, you know the earliest um, Christian times. Um, there's always some founding in biblical text. So let's look at why replacement theology, uh, people who support that might have that position. They start off with uh, Galatians 6, or they, they, one of the, their supporting arguments is Galatians 6.16. And if you read that, and, and for as many as walk 
according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Okay? And they call the Israel of God uh, the church and the Gentiles. But I, I believe, and most people believe, that's an incorrect interpretation. That it's, it's really referring to the remnant of the believing Jews. And if you go to Romans 11, and we're going to talk a little bit about Paul there, um, they are Abraham's spiritual descendants because they believe in God and rely, rely on his grace. And so, much like Abraham, whose faith was counted as, um, uh, as his righteousness, um, this remnant uh, is it's not a separate reference to the church of the Gentiles. Um, second uh, scriptural argument they make is that the Old Testament prophecies regarding Israel are being fulfilled or replaced, hence the word replacement theology, by the church. And so the church is fulfilling these prophecies, therefore it's the church that, that, has the, the, that is in fact Israel. Um, they, t they talk about the New Testament having priority over the Old Testament, i.e. the Abrahamic covenant, doesn't have authority because the New Testament has replaced the New Covenant, replaced the Abrahamic Covenant. But once again, we go back, that's why it's so critical to understand the everlasting, remember Olam and Dolom, um, that that's, that covenant as it relates to the land and, and Israel's security in the land is something that most biblical scholars will ascribe to. And then finally, probably one of their strongest arguments is in 1 Peter 2, 4 to 10. And in, in, depending on which Bible you use, which translation, you may see the heading, if, you, if your Bible has headings, it's called the chosen stone and the chosen people. And, um, and we won't read the whole thing, but if we go to uh, 8, 9, and 10, and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumble, uh, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had obtained mercy, but uh, now have obtained mercy. Now, to understand Peter, and we don't have time to go into this in detail, is you have to know who Peter was talking to. Okay. And it's very, very clear. And I've studied this a lot. I know Pastor Ron has studied this a lot. Peter is talking to believing Jews. Um, believing Jews. To believing Jews. Uh, to believers that were scattered from the diaspora. He's not contrasting the church in Israel. Uh, and that's where replacement the theology and suppressionist uh, supporters will focus in on that. Uh, he's contrasting the remnant and the non remnant. Okay, so he's talking to the believing Jews, and therefore, he's talking about them being the chosen ones. So, um, what's the future for Israel? Um, I think Paul says it well in Romans eleven twenty-five to 27. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So let's be clear. Israel has been temporarily and partially hardened. But God hasn't rejected them. All Israel does not mean that every individual... And the nation will turn to the Lord, but it does mean that the nation as a whole will be saved. And just as the nation as a whole um, hasn't rejected the Lord, we know that there are believing Jews. And, and secondly, in Revelation 12 really um, sets, says a lot about what the future of Israel is. The Verse 1, the woman who's referred to there is the people of God, which is really reference to all the saved Jews and Gentiles throughout history. And that verse two, which starts to talk about, um, which is setting up um, uh, Satan coming into the battle in heaven, the real travails of the nation of Israel did not occur at Jesus' time, but lies ahead in the second half of the tribulation. So the, the Bible's making clear John and his Jesus and his revelation to John that uh, Israel is going to 
um, suffer because their rejection of the Messiah the first coming. We know that ultimately um, uh, Satan is going to have his way for some period of time uh, in the tribulation, but God is going to care for this remnant just as he did for them in Sinai in the wilderness. And that's really clear in verse 6 because there's a reference to Exodus in that scripture. And then verses 7 to 17 of Revelation 12, which is God versus Satan, the archangel Michael is the defender of Israel. Um, once again, complete clarity on that scripture. Satan's cast down. The final three and a half years will be difficult persecution for the Jews. But the second coming cannot happen until the Jewish nation is converted to the Messiah and calls on him to rescue them. And he will protect the remnant. Um, in verse 14, uh, there's a reference to two wings of a great eagle. And that is the specific reference to the protection of the remnant. And Satan's going to give up on the remnant, okay? That's clear in verses 16 and 17, and he's going to go after individual believers, which will include 144,000 witnesses. So, we've got Zionism. We've got what should be the Christian position, um, that the Jewish people are the chosen people, that Israel is um, their protected holy land, and that they will return. And yet you've got them clearly rejecting the Messiah, okay? And the, the contrast, going back to what Pastor Ron did in the past three weeks, is, is it maybe rejection of the Messiah among the Catholic people, but some critical principles that were lacking? So how do you witness to Jewish people? Why do you witness to Jewish people? Um, they read much of the same Bible we do. Um, we'd start off with the fact that more Jewish people have come to faith in Messiah over the last hundred years than in the history of the church. And that is some, some data I pulled up. 80% of those Jewish people have come to faith because of gentle, uh, uh, Gentile witnesses. People like you and me. Now there, uh, I got this from uh, a rabbi who was who became a Lutheran pastor, and I've got a book in my library, and he, it's, it's called like witnessing, uh, a Lutheran witnessing to Jews, or it's got a catchy title. Um, and uh, I, 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 he has this last section, he talks about these uh, three misperceptions, and I thought they'd be a good way for us to end our time. The first is a common thing you might hear from Christians, we don't need to witness to Jewish people because they are God's chosen people and they have their own way to the Father. Sort of this coup to covenant approach, right? That Jesus is the Messiah for us and they have Abraham. Well, the Christian support of Israel should not be solely to advancing their understanding of bringing about the end times. Yes, we, we want to be supporting of Israel. Um, and, and I think Jews appreciate that and are encouraged by that and they they call us their friends because of that. But in some ways, if that's the only reason we're doing it, um, to fulfill end time prophecy, um, that would almost be a little bit of a form of anti-Semitism in some ways, right? You know, you're just you know, supporting them for that reason only. But we know that Jesus says that there's no other way to the Father except through him. And that even for the Jewish people, remember Jesus was talking to Thomas when he spoke in John, and he says, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when I, I have a few Messianic Jewish friends, and ultimately that's the path that they came through. You know, they, they, they recognized um, when they started studying more and were ultimately convicted by the Spirit that um, the Messiah, uh, Jesus was the Messiah, and that the only way that they were going to get um, everlasting salvation. And that's a whole other interesting thing, is whether or not Jews believe in everlasting life. Okay, I will tell you that I don't believe that they do. Okay, And I think most people agree with me on that. So the promise of, of eternal salvation is a compelling one if you're witnessing to a Jewish person. 
Second misconception from this book, the Jews had their chance and rejected Jesus. Now salvation is for the church. Okay, This is really the classic replacement theology. And the people who support it, I believe, really do have an anti-Semitic um, spin on this. Um, you know, when the riot, I was thinking, praying about this when I was putting together these notes, when the riotous Jewish crowd um, said, his blood be on us and our children, Okay, um, remember that statement literally hours later was forgiven by Jesus on the cross, <laughs> right? What was the statement again? His blood be on us and our children. So when, when, when that's when mm -hmm. Jesus is in front of Pilate, right? Mm -hmm. And Pilate's washing his hands, okay? Um, that's often prescribed to the Jews quote, abandonment of Jesus um, from a declaration perspective. Now, first off, you can't give the proxy for that statement to every Jewish person that would be right, okay? But secondly, it is the same way our sins are forgiven on the cross, that that should be forgiven on the cross, agree? And, and so I think um, Paul really bears his heart on this more than any other. Remember, you, know, you might say Peter was witnessing to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. But um, I think if you look at Romans and really study Romans, and I think we're gonna be doing Romans again here soon, um, uh, you really hear Paul's heart for the Jewish people. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that's Romans 1.16. Now, Jew first, Greek second, wasn't, understand that Paul always, um, when he went to preach, he went to the synagogues first. It wasn't, okay, I'm done with them, and now I'm going. It was always a witnessing to the Jews. Um, and there's a distinction between Israel, the church, Israel, the nation, and Israel, the ethnic people. I hope that's one of the takeaways you'll get from this, um, that as Paul defines Israel, um, anyone who's trusted in the promise of God for their salvation is really what he calls the church. But Israel uh, really stands at a, at a critical point in history. You've got you know, ethnic Israel that is looking for their Messiah. And you've got um, the the church, which is really embodies us and can embody any Jewish people, any Jewish person who accepts Jesus as the Messiah. And that's where that we will we will get the promise of eternal salvation. So, um, you know, regardless of ethnic background, um, anybody who trusts uh, God for their salvation, that includes the Jewish people. Um, and you know, Paul laments over the Jews uh, in Romans 10, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer is to God for them is that they shall be saved. So Paul's desire is for the Jews to be saved. I believe that it's God's as well. And then lastly, well, why bother witnessing to Jewish people if Paul assures us in Romans 11 that all Israel will be saved? Um, we should never desire for anyone, including the Jewish people, uh, until the ingathering to languish in unbelief. Um, you know, my dad didn't, uh, died a year and a half ago, and he didn't really accept Christ until the very end of his life. Um, and he was a great man, and but I believe he missed out on a lot. And, you know, while the gift of eternal salvation uh, comes with even came to the thief on the cross. We know that the the life uh, of in Jesus and all that goes with that is uh, a blessing that we would all want others to, to have as well. And so I, I often say that um, people who languish on the, who get it at the very end, um, while we all maybe they're not going to get as many crowns and rewards but we're all gonna end up in the same place. At the same time, I think, um, during at least this life, there's so much more to be gained from, um, from them coming to Christ sooner than candidly waiting until the very end. And so, I would just tell you that 
you know, their lives would be changed, can be changed the same way our lives would be changed. And that's why I think witnessing to the Jews is critically important. So um, that's it. And I'm happy to take any few questions. I think we're ready for